Welcome everyone to OrthoFi's Industry Expert Webinar featuring Dr. Bill Dissinger. We're super excited about the, the um, presentation that we have coming for you tonight. We're gonna have lots of time for Q&A at the end. Uh, for those of you who are joining one of our webinars for the very first time, the format for this series is to bring in some of the industry's most trusted experts, and we spend an hour learning from them. This year, our primary focus of the webinar series has been to take our content from Nexus, which is OrthoFi's annual business meeting, and then convert that content into one-hour learning sessions that we share with our industry. And I would love for you all to make sure you stay tuned at the end of the meeting to learn a little bit more about the Nexus meeting for 2024. We would love to have any or all of you join us there. Um, throughout the webinar, you'll be able to submit your questions using the Q&A, not the chat. And um, so make sure that you're, you're adding your questions there in the Q&A. Um, and then we're going to cover those at the end of the webinar. So uh, this is a topic that really often you know, brings up a lot of questions. So just you know, keep putting your questions there in Q&A. We'll keep track of them. And then at the end, we'll have a chance to, to run them by Do Dr. Dissinger and let him answer. So our industry expert for tonight is Dr. Bill Dissinger. Uh, he maintains two private practices in Oregon, and he's lectured and taught all over the world. He's rec recognized as an expert on many subjects within the specialty of orthodontics. Dr. Dissinger is also a key thought leader for both ORMCO and for dental monitoring. And he's also an adjunct professor at the University of the Pacific Department of Orthodontics in San Francisco, California. Dr. Dissinger has published numerous articles and he's also written a book on a variety of subjects within the specialty of orthodontics. And he and his wife, Carrie Lynn, have been married for over 25 years and they have four sons. Um, I personally love getting to know Dr. Dissinger as we have prepped for the Nexus meeting earlier in the year and then also the webinar. I appreciate so much how responsive he is, um, despite what I know must be an extremely busy schedule with all that he has going on. Um, welcome, Dr. Dissinger. We're so glad to have you here with us. And we're looking forward to spending the next, um, you know, the next 48 minutes learning from you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedules. Um, looking at my shiny forehead here, um, you know, during COVID, we all we all uh, did great because of the uh, the Zoom boom and uh, and our practices. And uh, I think some hair specialists might uh, do well off of my <laughs> Zoom boom here. But uh, I'll uh, I'll quit uh, talking nonsense and let, let's just dive right into it. Thanks, Marla. I really appreciate uh, you having me here tonight, and uh, excited to be here. Thanks so much. We're excited to have you. So I love this slide. Uh, it just, it really touches my heart. Uh, disruption is not the end of the road. It's a detour to a better destination. Uh, I'm sure my parents uh, probably thought that uh, uh, this applied to me growing up as a kid, but for my practice, uh, ever since I, I've been in it with my dad, my dad was a disruptor. Uh, for those of you, the, apparently I can't talk to a computer, I'm sorry, but for those of you that that knew my dad or have heard of my dad, he was kind of the American father of the Herbst appliance. Um, back when Herbst was really, really controversial, and he was definitely a disruptor in the in the field of orthodontics, and I was so fortunate to, to be mentored by him, uh, to work with him, partner with him. Uh, and eventually uh, take over his uh, amazing practice that he had started. But what we're going to be talking about tonight is is disruption. It's disruption within our specialty. And the ultimate disruption that we all just went through COVID, as I was just alluding to earlier, but that was a huge disruption. It wasn't a huge disruption in our life, our businesses, our practices. Um, you know, we all got shut down for those of us in the on the West Coast a little bit longer for, for some other areas of the country. But it was really scary. We didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know where we're going to have a business to come back to, where our staff's going to come back, where our patients going to be there, what was going to happen. And during that time, it was also a time of reflection, though. And we got to spend a lot of time analyzing our practices for, for those of us that shut down, but still kind of kept working some. 
Uh, we had time to really dive into our practices, what was working, what wasn't working. Uh, we also got to spend a lot of time at home. And that was, uh, I just, as bad and scary as that time was, it was actually for our family, a really special time. Uh, there was a show that we watched during that shutdown. And um, it's, if, if you haven't seen it, uh, I don't know what's wrong with you. You should. It was Ted Lasso. Uh, they've had three seasons now, but that first season uh, was just a, a phenomenal phenomenal show and um so many great lessons in in that show that that uh, Jason Sudeikis wrote in there and 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 taught us but there was one one particular uh uh scene that really struck me and it was in i think maybe the fourth or fifth episode he was in a bar and he was having this dart contest with kind of the protagonist guy of the show uh Rupert and they're throwing darts and and, and Ted Lasso Jason Sudeikis he's talking and he's He's throwing these darts and as he's throwing these darts he's talking and he says you know Rupert because Rupert was kind of making some comments about him and says you know people have always misjudged me and I never really understood it much and, and didn't really get it but as I got older I kind of quit worrying about it then one day I was driving my kid to school and and I looked up on the wall uh, on the side of the school and they had this quote that was quote on the side of the wall by Walt Whitman be curious not judgmental and I want you to think about that. Be curious, not judgmental. And as orthodontists, as dentists, just anybody in the medical profession, we're kind of taught the opposite. We're kind of taught to be judgmental rather than curious. We're supposed to be judgmental about new products, new techniques, all those things. We're supposed to deeply analyze stuff. And you know, sometimes we get analysis paralysis, unfortunately, in our profession. And that that time that we were shut down, it really opened my eyes to some things in my practice that I had been judgmental about that that I thought I'd made some good decisions about, but but ultimately I hadn't. And I decided coming out of that shutdown, I was going to be curious. I was going to be curious about a lot of things in my practice that I hadn't been before. And it really helped me to to move forward. So uh, you know, Ted Lasso, he's my man. He he really helped me get to that next level. But what are patients looking for? In these next few slides, I want to thank uh, Dr. Jamie Reynolds. Um, he had shown these slides at the Nexus meeting that Marla was referring to, and I just thought they were extremely powerful. So he he's let me use these slides. I've kind of tweaked them a little bit uh, for this presentation, but I'll give a big shout out to Jamie and you know always give a shout out to Jamie. Those of you that know him, the guy's phenomenal. But what are patients really looking for? So uh, they had gone in and looked at some really top orthodox practices around the country and looked at what their five-star reviews were, which were 99.9% .9 of all their reviews on Google and Facebook. And what were some of the common, de common denominators with those practices? And if you look at this, you know, this, this kind of makes sense for us, you know, in our orthodox field, friendly, professional, helpful, amazing, not sure what that really means, but, you know, apparently we're amazing or these practices were amazing, comfortable, nice, kind, welcoming. But look at number eight. Number eight is results. Does that surprise you that the results is, is that far low? That, that's a terrible sentence. I'm not an English major. I apologize. But is that low on the list? Number eight is results. And, you know, if you look at the AEO and the ad campaign they're doing, that's kind of what they focus on. They focus on that we're the experts and the results that we're going to give patients are superior to what, you know, do-it-yourself ortho or or even GPs or whatever we're going to do, we, we really focus on, you know, our superiority of our results and, and, and how we treat patients. But patients come to us just assuming they're going to get good results. I mean, they're paying us as a specialist. Of course, they're going to get good, good results from us. Why, why would that even be in question? So if you look at it at that, at that kind of viewpoint, that being number eight is not that surprising. But let's talk about the big purple box Smile Direct Club. And we've all had patients come into our practices that have used Smile Direct Club. They're a little bit screwed up. And we got to fix them up. How many patients are out there, though, that use Smile Direct Club that didn't get screwed up? So I went into my local uh, Google search for Smile Direct Club here in Portland, Oregon, and just want to see what people were saying about them. I was expecting to have you know really low ratings on them. 47 with 930 Google reviews here in the Portland, Oregon area. I mean, that's remarkable. First of all, they do an amazing job 
garnering reviews from the patients. So kudos to them. I need to find out how they're doing that because we got like 500 and we feel pretty good about ourselves. But what about 4.7? Does that surprise you? Would you have thought that Smile Direct Club had a 4.7 rating in Google? I did. And I was showing this to my wife and my wife was like, seriously, that, that they have that good a rating? I said, yeah, that's, that's remarkable. What were the common things that patients said about Smile Direct Club? Friendly. Hmm. That's the same thing that they said about us. That's number one, wasn't it? But look at number two and three, easy and quick. Are we easy and quick for the most part at an orthodontic office? That's not really how most people view an orthodontic office. Actually, a lot of people view us as the same as like a, a contractor. It's like, yeah, they'll tell you 12 months, but just plan on 15. You know, it's going to take you at least 30% longer to finish that that uh, that uh, building project than what, they, what the contractor told you. That's what people say about us as orthodontists too, by the way. So friendly was number one, same as us, but then easy and quick, which is different. And then it gets back in the same things as us, professional, kind, helpful, comfortable, customer service, knowledgeable. Those are the things that we have, but easy and quick, we don't have. So look at them side by side. Very, very similar if you look at that, except for easy and quick, except for easy and quick. That's got to mean something, doesn't it? That's got to get us start to starting to think. So you know, uh, Marla mentioned that I've been married for over 25 years. It's actually, we're we're starting our 30th year of marriage. So we've been, we hit 29 this past summer. And you know, life and learning are a journey. And for those of you that marry that are married, you, it's you really know that. Um, this is my beautiful wife here, and um, you know, she's amazing. We were high school sweethearts, and uh, just can't imagine my life without her. But we were in this um, this kind of marriage class thing. And we had read this, read these books and, and we would meet each week talking about the, the each chapter that we read each week. And this one chapter that we were reading was about your first year of marriage. And in that first year of marriage, you know, kind of what it was like in the transition and everything. And so the first few couples were talking and they were saying how hard that first year of marriage was and just, you know, it was a real struggle. And particularly the wives were talking about you know, uh, their husbands just, you know, they were worthless, you know, they just were so bad. And, um, you know, and, and just, they thought, oh my gosh, should I marry the wrong person? Are we going to get divorced? Whatever. So then we got to me and, uh, and I got, I was the one that talked first before my wife. And I said, gosh, that's terrible. You guys, this first year of marriage was so hard. Mine was, ours was awesome. I mean, we were both in school. I was in dental school. My wife is in nursing school. Uh, you know, we were barely had enough money to even pay our rent, you know, and we were eating rice and beans every night, but we loved it. We had a great time. And it just, I look back on that. It was just such a simple life. It was, it was awesome. And I look over at my wife and she's just got this look on her face. Like, are you kidding me? Like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? She goes, our first year was horrible. Like you were such an idiot. You didn't know what was going on. I hadn't trained you yet. And, you know, for, for us husbands out there, we do need to be trained. Um, we are idiots, and uh, yeah, after almost thirty years of marriage, I'm slightly less of an idiot, but I'm, but I'm getting better. But but I've just learned along the way, and one of the biggest things that I have learned is to listen. And I was not, and I'm still not, but I'm better than I was. But I was not a, a very good listener, and my wife would come to me, wanting me to hear her, um, and I typically would start listening, and then immediately start trying to tell her a solution. I didn't listen to what she really felt, what she wanted to say. And that was a big turning point in our marriage was when I finally learned how to just listen, how to let her talk and hear what she was trying to tell me. So in my practice, I started listening to my patients. For many years, I used Invisalign just when I needed to, just when a patient would only start treatment with me if I would do it with the liners. Otherwise, they were going to leave and walk out the door. Now, how many patients actually did walk out the door because I tried to talk them in the braces? I'll never know that, but I'm sure it was a lot. So in 2018, which is as far back as I look, because I know from 2018 and before it was this percentage or even less, only 14% of my patients I treated with clear liners. 
So not a very high percentage. If we went to 2019, I went up to 35%. I started using Spark Clear Liners from Ormco. This isn't a plug for, for Spark or anything like that. Uh, I, I do feel it's a great product. Um, and there's some independent studies that have been done by dental monitoring that shows that it has an 18% faster treatment time compared to Invisalign uh, across the country with all the practices that dental monitoring tracks across the country and that the tracking of teeth is 14% better. So I do think there's something there, but it's not what tonight's about. I'm more than happy to answer any questions in the Q&A uh, about Spark later on if you want me to. But I went up to 35%. 2020, obviously the world imploded and, and you know, it was kind of a screwy year, but I went up to 55%. If you look at after COVID shutdown, it was quite a bit higher than that. That's when I really evaluated my practice and what was working, what wasn't working. You know, for those of us during that shutdown, we really saw our clear liner patients kept tracking along without us and our racist patients really struggled. And when we came back from the shutdown, we just, all I did was repair broken brackets for like three weeks. So uh, that was a big wake up call for me. In 2021, all the way up to 80% of our new starts were clear liners. It really changed my practice. So if you look at from 2018 to 2021, basically just flipped the practice completely upside down. Last year, we went down a little bit. Why did we go down? Was it because I suddenly wasn't pushing clear liners anymore? No. Last year was a little bit of a slower year for us. I'm not sure if you all experienced that, but we were a little bit slower last year, and particularly in our adult population. Adults are about 98 to 99% clear liners in my office. There's some that choose to do braces. Our kids are closer to like 50-50. So as our, as our balance of adults to kids went a little skewed compared to what it used to be, we started going a little bit lower on our clear liners. So we we're at 75%. This year, year to date, we're at 68%. Why am I lower again? Well, we've had a really nice growth year with our uh, kid population again, with our teenagers. And again, they're not choosing the liners quite as much. The other thing though, is this is what my goal is. It's to be whatever my patients want. It's for me to listen. So I would say in 2021, 2020, 2021, like the second half of 20, I would push some people towards clear liners. They come in and kind of say that they wanted to do braces, and say, well, actually, you know, clear liners are great. And I'd kind of talk them into it. Kind of like I used to talk people out of clear liners and braces. What I started seeing is those patients that I talked into clear liners, some of them did great, but there were some of them that were our non-compliant patients. And some of those patients, we had to switch over to braces. And if you talked them into it and then they failed, it wasn't their fault they failed, it was your fault because they didn't want to do them in the first place. At least that's kind of, what, what was kind of intimated. So in our practice, I would love to treat as many patients as I can with clear liners. I do think it's a, it's a better way to treat people nowadays. Um, the hygiene is night and day, obviously. That's lower forces on the teeth. Uh, from a workflow for us, it's great. Um, but I don't want to force them into that. In our office, we charge $300 more for braces than for aligners. I'll say that again, because that's unusual compared to most offices out there. We charge $300 more for braces than clear liners. And what we tell them is if you're in braces, it's more of our time. Our time is our most expensive commodity. People like to think that your clear liner bill is your most expensive commodity. It's not. It's it's our time. It's, it's the doctor time. It's the staff time, team time. So we charge $300 more. Now, the other reason we do that is because if they do wash out on the aligners and we have to switch them over to braces, what do we charge them to switch? $300. So it's that $300 switch that it was going to be if you had started with braces to begin with. You're not out any more money than if you would have started with braces at the start. Now, as, as a business owner, is that maybe the, the best thing to do? No. But what are you going to do if you have a patient that just can't do it with clear aligners and you have to switch them over to braces? We don't have a lot of those, but we have some, as you all do as well. Are you going to punish them and charge them you know, $2,000? Are you going to do it for free because it's the family that you like? What's the number? Well, for us, it just we just did the $300. It makes it easy. It's an easy conversation. No one's mad. Everybody's happy. And we move on. So that's how we've done that. So my practice is quite a bit different than it used to be, but that, that's where we're at now. Bottom line, I got curious and I stopped being judgmental about clear liners. I said, you know what? I'm going to learn how to make this 
work and we're going to do really good at it. And we have, and we've learned how to be really good with clear aligners now. We are already really good with braces. Now we can be really good at whatever the patient wants us to be. So that's that's just been an awesome thing. So Chris Benson, uh, amazing, uh, an amazing person, uh, runs Benson Koppel and Associates out of North Carolina. Practice transition, I'm sure everybody knows his name, but uh, he gave a lecture at the Nexus uh, meeting as well. The uncertain winds of a changing, of a challenging economy. A lot of what he's talking about was what's what's coming with the economy, what's going to happen, what can we expect with our with our orthodontic practices. But there were some other things that he talked about as well. He talked about the workforce shortages that that we've had in America, and in particularly what we're having in the dental industry. Raise your hand if you're having trouble getting your office fully staffed. We are. We have been. It's it's been it's been rough. And unfortunately, I hate to break news to you, but it's going to get worse. If you look on the far right, dental assisting, which is what most of us hire, at least in most of our states, some of you have to hire hygienists, but most of us are hire, hiring dental assistants. It was already down from where it had been prior to COVID. Since after COVID has happened, it's down like another 13%. So the workforce shortages, they're going to get worse. That's going to keep declining. We're going to keep having less dental assistants entering into the workforce. We're going to have more retiring, more doing whatever people do nowadays. I don't know why, how people make it, but no one works anymore. So we have to come up with some different solutions because we're going to continue to have shortages for our, in particular, our clinical team. So in my opinion, we have to get more efficient. We have absolutely have to because we're going to have to be doing just as much orthodontic work or treating just as many patients hopefully more as we grow but with less team so we have to figure out how to be more efficient we got to get curious about that and figure it out we can't keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different result so we just we we got to make that change so i'm a, a huge and um, it was just down at Disney World, actually, after the orthopreneurs meeting with my uh, with one of my sons. And uh, this is the Honda Mansion in Disneyland. And it's a really good story about how the Honda Mansion came, came about. It wasn't originally supposed to be a ride. But around 1960, uh, Walt Disney was making some rides for the, uh, for the World's Fair, which is in New York. It was in Queens, New York. And one of the rides, he partnered with one of the, the motor companies. I can't remember if it was Ford or GM. Uh, but one of the one of the motor companies he was partnering with to make a ride for them. And when they were trying to figure out what they're going to do, they flew him out to Detroit and they showed him the assembly line. And he saw how that assembly line just always kept moving. It never stopped. It just kept going. And that gave him the idea of how to build rides. And that's what they eventually used for the Honda Mansion. So, you know, if you've been on the Honda Mansion, you got your doom buggies and they're all are in line and just keep going, right? doesn't stop, this keeps going, unless you have, you know, someone that's having trouble getting out of it. But for the most part, it's this continuous movement. And he realized with that assembly line set up that he was going to be able to get more customers through his rides at a higher rate. And he could get more people on rides, make people happier. Now, I'm not saying that in North Atlantic office, we need to be an assembly line. I'm not saying that at all. You know, sometimes we get accused of that, right? It's just an assembly line when we have a busy practice. But what I am saying is we have to think outside the box a little bit about how to be more efficient, just like Walt Disney thought outside the box on how to be more efficient. So coming out of coming in, or we were in COVID and coming out of COVID, we were working with a company called Braces Academy, and they have an app called Orthodontic Screening. And patients upload their pictures, and then we check them, and 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 that's how we do our virtual visits. And we still use Ortho Screening for a lot of things within our appointments. Uh, and we do that for any virtual consults that we want to do. It's a great product. And so this is a gal uh, that submitted her pictures on uh, through our app. And we're looking, checking the fit of her aligners, saving her a trip into the office. Now, it is an appointment for us because we are having to manually check them. But it's saving uh, the uh, appointment time. Here she is. She had 10 months of treatment. We only had four appointments. Now, this was not a very difficult case. She had some flared incisors and we we're closing up some spaces and stuff. But I want you to look at only four office appointments and one virtual. That's where we need to get to. That's the type of efficiency that we need to have. We can definitely do that with clear liners for sure. We can even do it with braces. We can get more efficient with braces. I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
But that was kind of my first venture into virtual consults, virtual patient appointment checks and, and things like that. And it was great. And then 2021, I saw a lecture that just blew me away. This guy blew my mind. And it was Dr. John Warford, Dr. John Warford out of South Dakota. And he is a huge clear liner practice. He had been doing Invisalign for years. He actually had switched over to Sparkle Liners in uh, 2019. Um, but he had been a dental monitoring pra uh, practice for, for quite some time. And he was describing how he ran his practice. He was starting 600 clear liner patients a year, plus about another 100 braces patients a year. And he was working nine doctor days a month. No associate, just him. I was like, wait, 700 starts, nine doctor days a month. All right, sign me up. Sign me up. Where, 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 where's the dotted line? Where do I sign up for that? And so I was texting him, calling him like, man, I, I need to learn this secret sauce. And he talked about dental monitoring. I love telling stories if you haven't picked up on that, but um, this is just kind of an illustration of what I want to talk about for our orthodox practices. So I, I do wear golf outfits like this. I'm, I'm kind of weird. I love Ricky Fowler. He's, you know, wears the orange pants and, and uh, so that's where I get my inspiration. I went to Oregon State, which uh, also is an orange school. And, and so that's why I, I, I go with that. But uh, this is my son caddying for me in a, in a golf tournament. And that was my first job. My first job was caddy. I caddied at the country club that my dad belonged to, my mom and dad belonged to, but mostly my dad played at. And uh, I'd show up every Thursday afternoon. That was kind of men's afternoon. And then every Saturday morning. And I would caddy Thursday afternoons and Saturday mornings. My dad would only play on Saturday mornings, though. He never played on Thursday afternoons. And I remember talking to my dad and I asked him, Dad, why don't you play on Thursday afternoons? All your buddies are here. All the same guys you play Saturday mornings are all out here on Thursday afternoons. My dad's answer was, well, Bill, my job is different. My job is different than what my friends have. They can leave their offices and their business can keep going. As an orthodontist, if I'm not there, everything stops. I have to actually be in the patient's mouth for the business to go, for us to be making money. So I can't leave on Thursday afternoons because I can't take that time off. And, you know, that really struck, uh, stuck with me. I brought that same mentality into practice when I started working. And, you know, there's a great book called The Ant and the Elephant. Um, and if you haven't read it, it, it it's, it's a great read. It's an easy read. I don't read very much, but when I do, they're always great books because they're from, from recommendations of other people. I think Dr. Glenn Krieger actually had recommended this one. And there was a quote in there that I really liked. It says, follow the path as laid out before you and don't bother asking questions. The elephants, in this case, the elephant was trying to find paradise or the orthodox in our case, life after all is very hard. Now our life isn't very hard, but we've made it harder than it needs to be because we've never asked questions. We've never, we've never questioned the status quo of, of what we're doing and as an orthodox, how we run our practices. So I started asking questions and John Warford helped me ask those questions. And coming out of that, I was like, what level of efficiency can we get to? And so we moved every, all of our patients over to dental monitoring. And we took a course, learned how to use it, and I uh, highly recommend that if you look at dental monitoring, that you take a course or you, you have someone come in and train and your team has to be a part of this. So the course that I took, I had two team members with me and we learned together how to do dental monitoring and my team was as excited as I was about it. But if you don't know what dental monitoring is, um, the patients hook up their iPhone to this little, what's called a scan box, and each week they will take pictures with their phone and the phone uh, app walks them through how to do it. Those get uploaded into the dental monitoring program and then artificial intelligence is actually checking all that for us. So we're not having to manually check these. Artificial intelligence is checking it. If the artificial intelligence sees something that's, that's not right, then it will alert us. So if it's for aligner patients, if they see that a tooth isn't tracking right, if an attachment is off, um, in braces, is there a loose brace? Uh, we can check bites, do virtual bite checks and let us know when they're class one. Uh, are the wires passive? Uh, it checks hygiene for us. Just from a hygiene standpoint alone, I think it's amazing, but alert us when there's hygiene issues. It'll alert, alert us if there's a little change in gingival height, all these things. It's pretty amazing. So the question gets asked to me all the time when I'm talking about 
what we're doing in our practice with, with virtual monitoring. Okay, if we never see our patients, are they going to pay us? You know, and for those of us, those, those of you that are on this call, I would imagine a lot of you are already using OrthoFi, uh, but OrthoFi obviously has amazing numbers because, uh, you know, they were the company that really helped us start pushing our payment plans out further to allow orthodontics to be more affordable for patients. And the data shows that people will continue to pay you even if they're done with treatment. As a matter of fact, most of the defaults occur within treatment time. It's not after treatment time. Most of it occurs within treatment time. And it's also very early in treatment time. The good news is that if someone does default, you typically have already collected around $2,400 before they start defaulting. So you've paid for your services and then you can do whatever you want to do at that point. You can end treatment or, or, or treat them basically pro bono, which is what we usually do, which thankfully we hardly ever have to do that. Our, our default rate is 1% right now. and has been uh, for a long time. As a matter of fact, we hover between about 0.3% and about 1.4% somewhere in there. So uh, we're not worried about that, but you can do many different ways of payment plans and people will pay us, but you have to have the right protocols and an orthofy definitely has those right protocols. So they didn't ask me to put these slides in there. I asked, I, I asked for slides because I think it's important because I, every time I give these lectures on uh, virtual monitoring, I get asked a question about financing and it's just, it is a non-issue, but you have to have the right systems in place, whether your office is amazingly good at it or whether you're like us and use orthofy, uh, to do this for you, which I, I think is the best way to do it. This is just showing kind of the average delinquency uh, off of gauge numbers uh, over time, and then compared to what OrthoFi is. OrthoFi has 42% lower accounts receivable delinquency than the gauge national average. I would argue that gauge's national average is quite a bit lower than the actual national average because offices that are using gauge are typically some of those higher end functioning offices that do things really well already. They're using Gage to get even better. The offices that aren't doing very well, um, their accounts are gonna be a little bit more delinquent. As a matter of fact, I just saw some paperwork for, for an office uh, last week. Their accounts receivable 22% delinquency. You know, that's unacceptable. And they set up their accounts for people to pay them like in the treatment time and all that. So it's, so don't worry about that. If you're worried about using dental monitoring, we just recently did a study on this. So this is the stats on dental monitoring offices that are on OrthoFi. The OrthoFi average for just regular offices, not, not dental monitoring, but just all OrthoFi offices is 97%. Um, so only 3% delinquency. The gauge, as we just saw, 5% average delinquency. So offices that are using dental monitoring and OrthoFi, 2% delinquency, so actually better than OrthoFi's national average. So not even, not even a worry. Now the power of this technology. So I want you to just real quick, we're gonna look at this patient, Jotaro. And Jotaro, he's got this blocked out lateral. It's not an easy movement to do with clear aligners. This is what the dashboard looks on dental monitoring. And if you see up above there, see those green circles and the red squares. So each week when they take their scan, if the teeth have moved appropriately and the aligners fitting like it's supposed to, they'll get a green go. Like, okay, you're ready to move on to the next one. They don't change their liners until they've heard back if they're supposed to move on. If they get a red, that means that the aligner's not fitting properly. We have a, a non-tracking tooth. And you know, you've seen that in the office where you get the little gap between the, the liner and the, and, the, and the tooth. So he was doing really good for first three weeks. And at number four, he got a red stop. Like, nope, he got kind of cocky and wasn't wearing as much as he was supposed to. And we got him back on track. Did good again for three weeks and got a few stops, got them going. And about every month or so, he kind of got off track, but we got him back on again. And we got all the way up through 32 aligners and even a little bit further. And he comes in at 36 aligners. This is where we're ready for refinement. That's what he looked like. What if we hadn't caught him starting to slack at liner number four? If we hadn't caught that, he would have kept going bad until I had him in, let's say, 10 weeks. Aligners aren't fitting. I got to do a mid-course correction. But... Is it the aligners that are not working? Is my treatment plan wrong? Is he not wearing the aligners? Well, of course he's wearing the aligners because he told me he's wearing the aligners, right? Because they always do. So I don't know what the problem is. So I do the same thing. We're going to have another mid-course correction. We're just going to keep going and we're going to struggle with this patient. But because of dental monitoring, we were right on top of when we got this guy right back on track, right when we needed to. So that's 
that's beautiful. And then here he is finished, 20 months of uh, treatment. I want you to look at those, six appointments. He only had six appointments. He should have had four, but I screwed up on my refinement uh, um, setup and I didn't get his upper canines in the right spot. And so I had to do another refinement to tuck the canines in. I went back and looked at it. And if I had done a better setup, I would have only had four appointments because I wouldn't have taken a third uh, third set of aligners, a second refinement to get them there. But six appointments still with that. And all those appointments, my team puts on the attachments. I'm just kind of a fly-by high, like checking the aligners to make sure they're fit. The refinement scan, I didn't do anything because I saw them on dental monitor. And I just put my notes in. The delivery, I didn't do anything except for a little bit of IPR at that refinement delivery. I did three spots of IPR. I never saw him again until I took his attachments off. So my doctor time, very, very minimal in this whole thing because we were keeping him on track, virtually monitoring him every single week. One kind of cool thing that's new with dental monitoring is these things called smart STL files. And you can only do it with dental monitoring and Spark. That's the, that's the combination of the two companies that, that can do this technology and no other companies have that out there. And what it is, is patients from their scans we can generate, generate STL files. So, you know, when we take a scan, it generates an STL file for either refinements or retainers. And what that does is it, the way they do it is it takes the initial enteral scan that we did. So we, we do our initial enteral scan to start treatment. It has that in storage and they know that. It looks at what was the last active aligner stage. So they get that from Spark and, and the pictures that they took to see where they actually are. And then it generates an STL off of that. We've done this on, I don't know, probably 50 refinements and uh, another at least 50 or more for final retainers where we don't have them come back in for an intraoral scan. We generate the STL off of their dental monitoring pictures that they take at home, saving that refinement scan appointment. They show up, we have the retainers, even a bonded retainer ready to go, take their attachments off, place the bonded retainer, give them their final clear retainers right there save an appointment. If it's a refinement, we generate refinement aligners off of that so they don't come in for the scan, they just come in for the delivery. How cool is that? That's awesome. Just be more and more efficient, just using technology to our advantage. How do I do wire checks? How do I use dental monitoring for braces patients? And I took a little while to switch over my braces patients to dental monitoring. I did just clear aligners for about a year and then I, did dental, and then I added all of our braces patients on uh, to dental monitor, we've been doing it, that for over a year now. And I, I wish I had done it from the start. I have so much better control over these patients now. I know exactly what's going on. I know when problems happen. How many times do you have a kid come in? It's always a teenage boy. I have four teenage boys, so I can say this. It's always a teenage boy, walks in at three o'clock. They got to have the after-school appointment. You know, they walk in at three o'clock. They got three brackets off. Hey, how long has those brackets been off? Uh, I don't know. It's like a couple days after my last appointment, which was eight weeks ago, I'm like, dude, hey, think about calling us. Oh, I didn't really think it mattered. Now you just lost eight weeks and you're going to lose another eight weeks because you can't move forward. It's just a wait. So uh, how many times that happened? It just drives you crazy. It doesn't happen anymore. But here's how I do wire checks now. So I get a note from, from my DM, my dental monitoring coordinator. So say I add, add Jennifer in there to do list, take a look at her. So she's in these uh, 016 smart arch wires. I look at these pictures. I'm like, okay, things are lining up pretty well. Look at that lower in, uh, if you notice the picture on the left is, is the initial picture, the first day we put brackets on. And here, here we are now about seven, eight weeks later. It's looking pretty good. But I'm, I'm looking at that lower left five. I'm like, it's kind of rotated down there. And I look and say, yeah, the brackets on there, but there's a rotation that hasn't gotten out. So I say, okay, the upper, we're going to do our normal change to 18275 wire. The lower, though, we're just going to go to 018. We're not quite, not quite ready for a 14275 down there. We're going to continue our dolphin elastics that we're wearing, uh, but add another wire. On. It's a 20-minute appointment in four weeks to put in that lower wire. That can be on a non-doctor day because I've already seen it. They can do it without me. And we already have the pan and repo appointment that we're going to have set up uh, eight weeks later. So that's how I'm doing wire changes now. We use Microsoft Teams, so I'll type those notes into Teams. You can see that note there that's, that's circled, that it's in Teams there. The team knows what to do. They're not having to wait for me to come to the chair. They bring the patient back, they start the appointment right away. I've already seen them. I'm just coming by, doing a little flyby high. All right. Now, if we're doing bondings or you know, glue removal or anything like that, that, that's me. But if it's just wire changes, they're good to go. 
So what could all this mean for our practices? So this is our practice numbers. These are all a bunch of numbers from the last couple of years on appointments. We reduced our appointments 16%. We reduced 177 appointments per month, 16% reduction. It's even more now that we're doing uh, the wire changes and everything more virtual, but 16% less appointments. So what's my team say about this technology? Do they think, oh my gosh, this is one more thing for us to do? Not at all. Our technologies have allowed us to have more days with our families. Wow, that's my team saying that. That's not me saying that, that's my team saying that. We can allow team members to customize their work schedules to better fit their life, part-time, work from home, whatever. I mean, you have a team that wants to work part-time now that didn't used to, or wants to do some work from home. We can make this work now. We can, we can customize our templates to work around my team's needs of what they need for their work and their family and, and it's work-life balance, not just for the doctor, but for the team as well. Before our change, we were scrambling to find a spot for appointments in our schedule. Now our days are so much smoother and we have openings. You told us we had to trust that this change would make it easier and now we see it. My team was really scared because we went to on-demand scheduling. We didn't schedule patients when they were leaving the building. We told them, hey, we'll be checking you on dental monitoring. We will call you when we wanna schedule you. And that's what we've done, it's been great. What's that do for us though, as far as if we do need to bring someone in all of a sudden, we see something that's not quite right on dental monitoring. Oh my gosh, there's a couple of brackets I've got to bring them in or this tooth is not doing what we want it to. We need, you know, we need to do a, a rebound appointment. We have room in the schedule to do that stuff now. Our appointments are predictable. Well, that's because I've already looked at the patient. They know what's walking in the door. We don't have those surprise broken brackets and, and everything else going on or broken wires or missing wires or whatever. We know what's happening when those patients walk in the door. They don't have to sit around and wait for the doctor to come to the chair. So we run on time more than we used to. So our practice life now, we have a lot of non-doctor days and we have doctor days. But what we've been able to do is decrease our doctor appointments by 28%. So doctors, 28% less appointments that I'm a part of at the chair, in the office. What does that do for you? What's that do for your schedule? What could that mean for our lives? It's time. It's time. We all get 24, 7, 365. We all get the same amount, no more, nor less. Some of us will live more 365s than others. But in those years, we all get the same amount of hours to play with. So what are we going to do with that time? How are we going to utilize that time? How are we going to most efficiently maximize that time. Well, again, get back to this and the elephant. You first have to ask the why of the journey that you start on. Mine was pretty simple. My why was simple. This a picture of my dad and my brother. So my dad went to Purdue University in Indiana, grew up in Indiana. This is at the Indy 500. My brother lived in Chicago. So I would fly from Portland to Chicago, uh, hook up with my brother Saturday morning. We'd drive down to Indianapolis, meet my dad, We'd play golf or do something on Saturday, then go to the race on Sunday, drive back to Chicago on Monday. And it was awesome. We did that every year for many, many years. Well, in 2010, my brother passed away. He had cancer, pancreatic cancer, passed away. And there were so many times that my brother asked me to do something. Hey, come out for this, or let's go, let's, let's fly here and meet for this, or let's do whatever. And 99% of the time, my answer to him was, I can't. Yeah, can't leave the practice. I got patients scheduled. I got to work X number of days a month. You know, for me, it was at the time was 17 days a month. Got to work 17 days a month in the practice in order for us to get everything done that we need to get done. You know, and I just, I let the practice tell me what I could do. I let the practice tell me I couldn't be with my brother. You know, that's just, I just, I look back on that and just shake my head. This is my priority right here. This is my family, my beautiful wife, my freaky tall oldest son there on the, on the, on my left, on the right, on the screen. Uh, he's 23 and he's like six, six monster. Then my other boys, I got a, a 21 year old and my twins are 17. I don't have a whole lot of time left with them. And I want to have as much time with them as I can. So my, my reasons are, 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 I fully admit are, are selfish in, in my time 
of what I want to utilize my time for. I want to be with them. But time's different for everybody. Imagine if you reduced your practice time needs of the doctor by 28%. What's that allow you to do to grow your practice? How many of us are, are constrained by we don't have the time or the room to grow our practice? Well, if you just freed yourself up 28% more, you can grow that practice as much as you want. Hey, if you can grow a practice 28%, God bless you, man, go for it. But you'll be able to if, if it if works because you have the time to do it. You could open a satellite practice. You got a more than a quarter of your time freed up to open a satellite practice, start another business, or you'd be like me, take more time. I said, I was 17 days a month. Right before COVID, we had gotten it down to 16 days a month. We're 11 now, we're 11 days a month. And we used to run six chairs. We run three and a half now, three and a half because two of the days of the week we're running uh, four chairs, two of the days we're running three chairs because we have a lot of part-time uh, employees now. That's a huge change in my life. That's it's it's been it's been great. This is my office a lot of the time. So places like this, sitting by a pool by the beach, there's dental monitoring, checking my patients. So I don't have to be in the mouth to do it. I can do this remotely anywhere. You know, these these friends that we have that work remotely, work from home, we can do that now. That can be us. The technology is absolutely there to do that. So as a team, what are you going to do? We have this amazing technology available to all of us to take advantage of. It's, it's, it's right there. So as a team, what are you going to do? Well, I heard a great lecture this past weekend at Entrepreneurs, and he gave this analogy. He talked about a train. And when you're standing there and this train's coming, you have three choices. You can either stand in front of the train, you can get run over. You can stay off to the side. You can wave it, wave at it as it goes traveling by you. Or you can hop onto that train. You can hop onto that train, you can drive it to the destination you want it to go. That does a great analogy. Because that's what technology is. Technology is a freight train coming at us. And what are we going to do? Are we going to jump on that train and embrace it? Or are we going to say, no, that's not for me. That's not for me. Well, I would encourage you just be curious and not judgmental when it comes to this. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time with us tonight. So let's open up for Q&A. Love that. That was a fabulous message for all of us. And um, we do have some questions. So um, We'll just jump right in there. So uh, there's several questions about dental monitoring. So I know that the audience would love to hear more. Um, you mentioned pretty early on about a course that you and your team took. And so um, could you tell us about the course and the name of the course? Yeah, so the, the course was put on by uh, by John Warford. And um, at the time it was, it was co-sponsored by just him personally and uh, by Spark. Uh, from Ormco, they put it on, and um, and dental monitoring. So the, the kind of the three companies. Um, John's started his own kind of, I don't know what you call it. Uh, I want to call it a, maybe it's a consulting company. I'm not sure, but he's he's running courses. I don't know the name of the company. Uh, I, I should. I'm sorry that I don't. But uh, but John Warford, uh, W A R F O R D. So War and then Ford. Um, John Warford. If you just Google them and look them up, uh, I'm sure you can find some information on that. Um, dental monitoring does courses all the time. So just, you know, uh, contact dental monitoring and, and find out who your local rep is and they could uh, kind of guide you as well. Okay. Um, and then you did mention that your team attended that course with you. Can you kind of mm -hmm. talk about what the dental monitoring process looks like for your team? Like, what are the things that specifically rest on them? Yeah, so I, I have one um, one one key um, dental monitoring coordinator, so one one team member who who does she's kind of the, the the key main person of it, and then I have a backup. So if if she's out sick or on vacation or something, and we we block her out for ninety minutes in the morning, uh, right first thing in the morning we block her because she's a she's a chair side assistant. We block her out ninety minutes in the morning, and then we block her out uh, the last thirty minutes of the morning, and then we block her out for forty five minutes at the start of the afternoon. So. That's two two hours and forty five minutes a day is what she spends on dental monitoring. 
And so she's answering uh, direct messages from patients. She's looking at, um, you know, when we get um, when we get alerted by the AI of, of something that's that's not right, whether it's the liner's not fitting right, broken brackets, wires, whatever it is, uh, she's checking all those all those messages from the AI that we get. And then from those, she will compile the to-do list. And the to-do list is what goes to me. And I spend, Monday is, is my heavier day just because we've had the, you know, the whole weekend uh, built up. But on Monday, I spend about 20 minutes uh, uh, dealing with, with dental monitoring uh, patient questions or, or going in and looking at them, putting my notes in teams for refinements and things like that. And I'll do that throughout the day on Monday. Um, and then Tuesday, I'm maybe about 12 to 15 minutes. And then Wednesday, Thursday, um, 10 minutes at the most. Today, I, I had, I think, five minutes of, of stuff I did with dental monitoring. So as the week goes, just because we you know, had the weekend build up. So my time is less than an hour a week that I spend on it. And like I said, she's about two, two hours and 45 minutes every day. Uh, four days a week is what she spends on it. Um, so from a, from a, a time perspective for what your team has to put into it, it's really not a lot. Now, now, at the new start appointment, we have to go through the training with the patient on how to take the, the scans with dental monitor with their phone and how to put the little scan box in their mouth and all that. And that takes about, that's probably seven to 10 minutes, depending on, you know, kind of the tech savviness of, of the patient. Um, but, you know, kids, it's like, they, they get it like that. We spend more time with the adults than we do with the kids teaching them how to do it. Uh, but about seven to 10 minutes at the new start appointment uh, has been added on uh, to deal with that. So. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how dental monitoring looks different for an aligner patient versus a braces patient. Do you, are you using it for both? Yeah, so we're using it for both. Uh, for aligner patients, what will happen is for aligner patients, it's being used to tell them if their teeth have moved appropriately to move to the next aligner. So each week they're taking their, their, their dental monitoring scans and they don't switch to the next aligner until they get that notification from dental monitoring that yes, your liner fits just how it's supposed to, your teeth are ready to move to the next liner. And that takes anywhere from about an hour to four hours, depending on kind of the bandwidth of the dental monitoring servers at the time. Um, if there's an issue, if it's like, hey, it's not quite fitting right, hold, then three days later, they will take a scan again. And we have automated messages that, that will go out to them that tells them which area of the mouth they need to focus on, like which, which is it upper right, upper left, whatever, front, back, what's not quite fitting right, where to focus there. We use clenchies rather than chews, but their clenchies or chews, whatever, where to focus that on. Uh, if they're using uh, Propel Vipro, the vibration device, maybe use that a little bit more. Um, and then if they get a second no-go at that third day, then that's when the AI alerts us, our team. So McKenna, my DM coordinator, it will alert her. She will look at it a little bit closer and and then decide, okay, can they, if they go three more days, are they going to get there or does she want me to look at it? And do you want, does she want me to look at it and say, okay, we've had two no-goes in a row. And I have it set up. So most of the time, if there's two no-goes in a row, I'll look at it. And sometimes it's like, okay, that's a tooth right now. I'm not that concerned about. Okay. We, we're, we're at this point, we're trying to make a lot of space. So we're doing we're doing sequential distalization or we're using some tads for a missing lower five and we're closing some molar space, but we got a canine way over here that's maybe not tracking quite right. In the grand scheme of things, I'm not worried about that tooth right now. There's bigger things I'm working on I want to keep going. Or let's say, you know, we're, we're uh, it's a patient where we're mostly just on anterior aesthetics and we got an upper laterals not tracking because, you know, it's always the upper laterals and we've got an upper laterals not tracking. Okay. I want that patient back in. Let's do a mid-course correction. Let's get them in. But we're getting the mid-course correction done right when we start getting a non-tracking tooth. It's not six weeks later. So I use the analogy to the patients that, okay, yeah, we're bringing in a little bit sooner than we had originally planned, but it's like the tortoise versus the hare. We're catching this early and we're not going to burn you out and then lose time in the end. We're going to keep you on track all along. We're constantly moving forward as opposed to running fast and stopping running fast and stuff. And so it, for us, we, we wind up getting done faster in the end than if we weren't tracking it with it. So that was right. a really long answer, but hopefully that was. That's great. That's great. Um, so you mentioned moving to 11 days per month. What is that the right 
mix that you're at right now? Yeah, um, 11 so, doctor days, yeah. Doctor days. Okay, so has that significantly affected your revenue? Did Was the goal to kind of keep your revenue the same? Or are you still growing? What does that look like? Yeah, we've had the best year we've ever had right now. We're, we're just, I mean, knock on knock on wood, we're, we're killing it right now. And we've done a lot of things. We've been working really hard on, on marketing and stuff. But I tell you, word is out there. We, we're having these people come in and say, I've heard, I've heard that I only need to come in like, you know, anywhere from like two times to four times in a whole year uh, with your treatments that you're doing. And word's getting out about that. Um, I did a podcast with Glenn Krieger last year talking about dental monitoring. And I said to Glenn, I go, you're not that cool. People don't want to come see you. <laughs> and, you know, Glenn took offense to that. I said, no, we're all of us. We're not that cool. Yeah. Um, think about your life. Is it, is it easy for you to get in to see a doctor uh, right now with your schedules? It's, it's nearly impossible. It's really, really hard. And, you know, think about like these teenagers that we're trying to get into our office. One, they all got to be after school, right? Cause no one can miss school. Um, the parents are having to get off of work, you know, and it's, it's not like they're just getting off of work and then bringing them here. And it's a, you know, two minute thing. They're having to drive from wherever they are, pick the kid up, drive to wherever your practice is, which I don't know about your practice, but uh, the majority of them actually don't even live in my town. So it's a two hour basically thing for them to have a visit in your office. If you can eliminate, let's say, you know, like in us, we've eliminated 20% of those appointments. Isn't that a good service for people? That's a great service. But yet we're seeing them every single week. We're seeing them every single week with dental monitoring. And they're getting messages from us every single week. Our customer service level and our touch points are through the roof compared to what they used to be. They feel so much better taken care of, even though they're not having to not see us in person. It's it's a great, it's a win-win for everybody. And a lot of doctors try to say that, oh, this is all about you and your time. It's not. If that's if that's the message that you get, you're you're missing it. This is about their time too. It's about all of our time. Yeah, exactly. You can tell um, yeah, I'm passionate been, about this. So yeah, I, and I've been thinking the whole time. You know, um, I had four daughters that they're grown now, but the time that that would have given me back when they were in braces is just fascinating yeah. to think about. Or how about I mean, they come in for those retain those aligner checks? They just, they just took two hours out of their day and they sit down in the chair and you look at them for, I mean, really it's, it's a 30 second check. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a disservice, you know, yeah. you, or you get done on those appointments and the kid looks, you go, that's it. Yeah. You know, and the parents thinking I drove all the way here for that. Yeah. You know, so. Um, so one other thing um, I did want to mention, I, I remember at Nexus, there was a lot of talk about um, the booking window really affecting the cut new patient exam rate. And so you mentioned that with dental monitoring, you're doing 16% fewer appointments. And my assumption is that that's really, really opens up your schedule so that when someone does call and want to be seen as a new patient, uh, you can get them seen much more quickly. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, the biggest part is in our clinic, but what we are able to do is we can double stack patient consults if we need to because mm -hmm. we have so much more availability in the in the clinic and we can you know we can we can mix and match you know we can mm -hmm. be nimble i think i've heard i've heard consultants talk about that about allowing your your team and your schedule to be nimble mm -hmm. uh, and so we can we can we can double stack when we need to like in the summertime july and august when you, you know you're everybody wants to come in and get started and you can't you can't put them out a week or two in the summer Put them out a week or two in the summer, they're going to go to the other person down the street because exactly. they want to get started in the summer, and, you know, and they all forget to call you until the last two weeks of August. And so you can, you can bring them in and, and you have the freedom in your schedule to have another staff member get them started with the pictures in, in, in our office and ICAP. And then I can be looking at those records and then we can hand them off to the treatment coordinator or we can hand them off to I, my office manager who handles all of our orthopy stuff and we can get going on that. And then we can just, we can mix and match and move them around because we have that flexibility now. Right. Um, so you, we talked a lot about dental monitoring. I know that you're also an orthopy client. Um, mm -hmm. What it's obvious from the slide that you showed that dental monitoring and orthopy together work very well. Um, 
what was your real decision maker on choosing OrthoFi and, and one of your favorite things about OrthoFi? Well, first of all, I was an idiot uh, for a long time. So uh, Jamie Reynolds, Jeff Kozlowski, John Graham, all these guys who were, you know, Jeff and Jamie were, you know, the, the founders and, and John was, you know, an early adopter and investor and everything. And they all were in Jeff Pascal. They were all telling me, oh, you got, you got to use this. And at the time I worked with a financial consultant that was very anti extending a, a plans and you got to run a hard check on everybody. And if there were B, you got to be really strict on them. And, and I just, anyways, so I, I didn't listen to them. And then finally, I was like, okay, I, I think I think it's time. And I was actually going to invest. I was going to invest in the company, Orthofy, at finally. And um, and then, like Orthofy had my check, and then it was too late. To, they said, no, actually, we're not going to do any more investing. So I missed out on all that. So that's why I'm still working instead of being retired. But <laughs> um, but finally, I decided to do it. And once we did it, in our first year of using Orthofy, our acceptance rate. And our new patient exams jumped 15%. 50, and we were a pretty good practice already. It jumped 15%. Because what was happening is we were losing patients, like our A, our A credit patients, they all started. C patients, you know, those are tough ones to start no matter what you're doing, whether you're using Orthofy or not. But we do have some C patients from time to time that come in. And with Orthofy, we'll put them on the extended payment plan with interest and everything. And, you know, most of them do fairly well. But it was our B patients. The B patients are the ones, especially after 08 and 09, we had a lot of B patients. They were the ones that, for the most part, paid all their bills, but maybe they had like one thing in their past that kind of dinged them. And a lot of people on the West Coast lost homes in 2008 through 2010. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were that, but they were good people. But because of our strict requirements, we weren't allowing them to pay us in a way they could afford. Mm -hmm. and, they're like, and we heard all the time, we love your office, but we can't afford it. They never said we were too expensive. They said, we can't afford it. And so when we switched to OrthoFi and we decided we were really going to buy, go by OrthoFi's recommendations and we really dove in, we said, okay, we're, we're, we're going by, you tell us what to do, and we'll do it. We just jumped through the roof on that acceptance rates because all of a sudden those B patients, they could afford us. And to the point where we had people filling out their Google reviews saying that we were really affordable. I was, and we're the most expensive office in town. Mm -hmm. They were calling us affordable because it's all about the monthly payment. That's right. And we were able to make that work for them. And our acceptance rate has continued to be high ever since. And then I showed the numbers earlier. Our delinquency rate hovers between a half a percent and like 1.2%. Mm -hmm. So even though we're more flexible, our delinquency is better than it used to be. We used to be around 3%. So not, yeah. not the three percent is bad, but I mean, it's less than it used to be. And we start more people. So, right. yeah, it's just, I, if I could go back and, you know, you always say, if you go back, you do, yeah, I would have, first of all, I would have invested from day one, but you know, mm -hmm. yeah, wouldn't we all same with testing well, and Apple and all that, right? We're glad you joined us, joined us when you did. Um, so we're about out of time. If you don't mind, um, stop sharing your screen. Oh, and, yeah, sorry. That's okay. I was supposed to do that a long time ago. That's, that's quite all right. Um, just wanted to show the audience uh, one thing, two things, actually. So first of all, um, if you are here with us tonight and you're not an OrthoFi client, um, if you complete a demo by the end of the month, you'll receive $2,000 off your implementation fee. And the first three practices that sign up, first three, will actually receive 50% off their implementation. So if you haven't seen a demo of the OrthoFi solution or haven't seen it lately, because there have been some changes that we would love to, to show you and, and talk to you. And we also have the full suite of solution now, including OrthoBank. So we've got a, we've got a solution that's right for you. Um, also, the Nexus meeting, I promise I'd share some information about this. It's going to be 2024, February 133. If you scan this code, you can register and join us and you'll receive a discount, an extra 5% off, which uh, depending on the ticket you choose, it's between 25 to $50 off. So we would love for everyone to join us at Nexus and um, promise it to be another great meeting. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for joining us. I think this has been fabulous. I know that our audience has enjoyed it. And those, those who um, missed something or uh, everyone who registered that didn't get to join. So if you have some team that didn't get to join, we will be sharing this out to everyone who registered. 
And thank you Suzanne, again for your time. Can I say one thing? Sure, uh, absolutely. Uh, Suzanne uh, Flores, if you want to just uh, direct message me and Facebook Messenger, I'll answer your questions. So yeah, you had a couple of there and I can, I'll answer those. If just direct message me. Great. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you everyone right. and have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.